Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Well, welcome again. It is great to be here together. It's awesome that we have to use our balcony. Such a cool thing. Yeah. So welcome. Yes, way up there. So we have been talking about coffee and donuts. Isn't that funny? Last week we discussed how Christian fellowship goes beyond coffee and donuts, and sometimes people bring some heavy real-life things into conversations in the Christian family, and that is okay, because that's why we're here. In the first week, we talked about how theologically, biblically, it's an object objectional fact that we are one body in Christ, that we belong together spiritually. And what a world right now to be in and trying to be together at the same time. Thank God for technology, thank God for masks, and all those things that we could do that. And God wants us to be together, again, even physically in person, so it's been nice to be together in church since June. And as we discovered last week that we can grow by helping each other go through things, we can also grow spiritually because we bring Jesus into these fellowships. And today that's really what this is all about, that we help each other grow spiritually. The goal of spiritual growth is actually Jesus. And I want to go to Colossians chapter 2. If you go to your Bibles, open up to Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 6. And Paul is talking to a church who has believed in Jesus, but they must not stop in their faith of belief they must go deeper and grow. And this morning and again today, or at the 11 o'clock here, one of the things that just pushes this message forward for me, and, and I want to share with you, is having more of God. I think that's a good desire to have. I think it's great to be saved from sin and have eternal life, but I'm not done with that. I want all that God has for me. I want to become who God wants me to become. And the Bible is clear. He wants me to become more like Christ. And look at Colossians 2, verse 6. It says, And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. You know what that picture reminds me of? John 15, the vine and the branches that we grow with Christ as we stay connected to him as he's the vine and we are the branch. And then let your lives be built on him. That's Matthew 7 where he talks about the parable of a person who builds their life on sand or the things of this world or builds their life on the solid rock which is himself, Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, if you hear my teaching and obey it, no matter what storm may come, you will still be standing. No matter what life throws at you, you will still be standing because you've been built deep in me and the truth of Jesus Christ. He goes on to say this. If you let your roots grow down into him and you let your lives be built on Jesus, then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught. And you will overflow with thankfulness. Notice that someone had to teach them the truth. Someone had to lead them to Christ. And so there we have the imperative that we need someone in our life to help lead us. Thank God for pastors and leaders, but thank God for moms and dads and friends and grandparents who have taught us the truth. Amen? Verse 8 is really interesting, though, because he goes on to say, Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world, rather than from Christ. Wow. You know what we need to know? We need to know the truth so we can tell what is a lie. We need to know Christ and the truth of Christ so that when we hear an empty philosophy or humanistic thinking that is of evil spiritual powers, we can tell. And I don't know about you, but I don't want my son and daughter to fall for some kind of humanistic philosophy because it doesn't save them. And it's a lie. 
I want to teach my kids the truth of Jesus Christ. Both of my kids have believed in Jesus for salvation, thank God. They have a childlike faith. They have put their faith in God. They don't just believe he's real. They believe that Jesus has forgiven them for their sin and has given them eternal life. Do I stop teaching them that or stop from there and just don't teach anymore? No. We keep going as a family and we keep reading scripture and teaching them so that their roots are deep. Because here's why. They're going to encounter more teachings in the world that are not good, that will counter God. He says this in verse 9, for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. Talking about Jesus lived in God when he was here on earth. So you also are complete. This is how people are complete. This is how you're made whole. This is how you grow and become spiritually mature. Through your union with Christ. What does that mean? That means your faith in Jesus for salvation. So you're saved. And what we call also sanctified, which is set apart, made holy in God's eyes. You are considered holy in God's eyes because the blood of Jesus Christ has made you pure and holy. Isn't that awesome? Romans teaches you that over and over again. We have that union with Christ, but it doesn't stop there. It continues to go and grow. And here's what's amazing. It says Christ is the head over every ruler and authority. Praise God for that. Guess what that means? Jesus is over you. Jesus is over me. Jesus is over every human being in this world. And Jesus is over every teaching of human philosophy. He is greater than any spiritual power in this world. He is the greatest spiritual power in this world. Jesus is. Amen. If that's the truth, then we must submit to Jesus and actively follow him, shouldn't we? Why is that? Because we might fall for another spiritual power. My children, our youth, our teenagers, our young adults, all of us, all adults, we could fall for a false teaching and philosophy if our roots are not grown in Christ and our identity is not in Jesus. In other words, what I'm saying today is we need spiritual growth. We need more knowledge, but we also need more spiritual maturity. The difference between knowledge and spiritual maturity, or difference between knowledge is obedience and knowledge. Sorry, I'm mixing that up. True spiritual maturity has to do with obeying and applying the knowledge you have received. It's one thing to know Jesus and know what he teaches. It's another thing to submit yourself to what he teaches and to apply it to your life. I'm concerned for anyone who's a new believer. It's a good concern. It's a, it's a good thing. Anyone who's a new believer, maybe a young believer. In other words, you can be an older person and give your life to Christ at an older age and you're a young believer. You're a new believer. I'm concerned that if we don't come alongside of them and help them navigate this new identity and new life in Christ, they will go back to what they're familiar with. Do you know that that's what we do in human nature? Human nature is we go back to what we're familiar with. Human nature is we go back to what we're comfortable with, what we know we can do and should do. I know that because I sometimes rather grab a bowl of ice cream than some broccoli. I was familiar with it. It's just easier to go back to what I'm comfortable with. That's just easy to do. Sorry, I used a really lame illustration to get that across. I'm concerned because if they don't know the new familiarity, the new relationship they have with God, they could be in trouble. To get comfortable and to get strong in their new relationship. And this may be many of us in this room. And by the way, because you give your life to Christ, you're going to find something that happens. Your circle changes. When you give your life to Jesus, you're going to notice that all of a sudden, um, the things that you used to think were good, you're like, oh, that's not good according to God. 
The things you used to say or do, it's not righteous. And so you're going to see your circle continue down that path, and you're going to feel like, I can't go down that path. And you can feel really lonely if you're all by yourself. Because you have this new identity in Christ. You have this new faith, and the Holy Spirit is in you going, that's not of me. This is of me. Go down this path. And church, that is why it's so important we get together. That is why it's so important that I don't just mean Sunday morning we get together, but we come around each other and help that newborn baby in Christ to learn his new or her new identity and way of living. Those who are familiar with Christ need to be with those who are not. It's that simple. And then we help them follow Jesus. It's kind of hard to do that, though. It's kind of hard to feed a newborn baby Christian. It's kind of hard to be with a young believer if we don't even get together to do that. And I fear that the natural thing to do for that newborn is to revert back to what's familiar. So church, I implore you today how important it is that we need to be together to help each other grow spiritually. It's so important. So let me get into some scriptures. But before I do that, I'm gonna ask, answer this question. Why can't I grow by myself, Ryan? That would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> wouldn't that be nice? Go to an island that's really beautiful and bring a Bible and pray and, and hang out with God, just grow. You don't have to deal with any mess with people. You don't have to deal with people's personalities. You don't have to deal with different opinions. You don't have to deal with anyone pushing you too hard. Or... Wouldn't that be nice? That's not biblical. It's not in scripture. That would be what we call Lone Ranger Christianity. And again, I'll say this again, someone is gonna miss out in growing because your example and your teaching isn't present. In other words, God has taken you through some things in your life to help people know how to navigate those as well. And then when you're getting the word of God because you're hanging out with Jesus and you're hanging out with God, you're able to teach someone the word of God too to help them go deeper. We can't do it by ourselves. And J.I. Packer, he's written a lot on being in fellowship in the body of Christ. He said this, God has made us in such a way that our fellowship with himself is fed by our fellowship with fellow Christians. Isn't that interesting? Like our desire is to grow in our faith in God, grow our giftings, grow our confidence, grow our faith, just belief, right? And confidence in God, grow our prayer life, grow our reading the Bible life, all those things we want it to mature, right? How many of us want to, to see that get better and stronger and to trust God more? Did you know that one of the ways you're fed and then one of the ways you grow is to be with other believers who are doing the same thing. A new circle. And by the way, just because we get a new circle doesn't mean we judge and condemn the other circle that we left. What we're doing is we're being sanctified or set apart and made holy and loved by God and growing so we can go reach and love that circle we once used to be a part of. I love my friends from high school. I love my friends, my neighbors. I love them. I'm not better than them. I'm not better than them. I might be better off because I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and I'm forgiven, but I care about them deeply so much that I'm going to read the Word of God and pray for them and seek God's face for them and go back and reach that circle because Jesus would too. But look at the need for us to be around other people. Colossians 3, 16 says this. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. It doesn't say half full. It says fill. To be pouring in. To be full. Let Jesus be so full in you that when you get around other people... Jesus comes out, especially one another. This context is about being with the body of Christ, other believers. 
Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Everyone stop right now if you're saying, well, he doesn't have a right to teach me and counsel me things about God. He's not the pastor of the church. According to Colossians 3.16, we are supposed to counsel and teach one another. Even if we're not ordained minister in the Assemblies of God or whatever organization you're part of. Isn't that awesome? You've just been elevated. You know why? Because you submit to Jesus first before you submit to me as a pastor. Jesus is over you before, he, before I'm over you. It goes Jesus first. And Jesus wants to fill you up and help you teach and counsel one another. You're that important to Jesus. There's no way, Ryan, I'm too broken and messed up. Yeah, maybe right now, but as you hang out with Jesus, he's super glue. He's going to fix you up. And by the way, Jesus uses us sometimes in our brokenness. Do, do I mean like complete disobedience? No. Do I mean complete like I'm not repenting and God's still going to use me? No. Repenting is to turn away from sin, turn towards God. We're never perfect until Christ comes back and glorifies us when he returns. The difference is God will use a repentant heart that is humble and understands they don't have it all together, but they bring Jesus into their life and to other lives. That's who he uses, willing hearts. And can I tell you something real quick? And this is just, I feel like the Holy Spirit wants you to know this. Quit trying to be perfect before you help people. Stop. I'm, I'm still not perfect, and I'm up here preaching to, I don't know how many people online and in here. I don't have it perfectly nailed down, but my Jesus does. Have you been through some things? Well, so was Jesus. He's been through it. So did his followers. And he did amazing things for the kingdom of God. He wants to use you. Hebrews 3, 12 through 14. Here's another important reason why we need each other. Hebrews 3, 12 through 14. This was back then. Imagine what it's like now today, how, much, how important this is. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Did you see that? It says brothers and sisters. Do you know what that means? That's implying believers in Jesus Christ who have faith in Christ. They're saved. The Bible is saying that make sure you encourage them. Unbelieving heart that's, that turns away from the living God. You don't want that. You don't want your heart to turn away. Let me keep going because it makes more sense in context. But encourage one another daily as long as it's called today. And that means the time before Christ comes back so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Sin wants to harden our hearts, and the devil wants us to also harden our hearts towards God. Sin is very deceiving, but when you have other believers around you to kind of keep you woke about it, I said woke, yes. I'm 36, I'm somewhat still young. Forgive me if it's really old too. But when someone goes, hey, bro, like, you know, th that's not what scripture says. And, you know, I just want, I just, I love you. And I want to make sure that you don't go down this path where you're practicing that. And, you know, that's because they love you. That's why they're saying that. It's not because they're better than you. We have come to share in Christ, last verse, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. And then the classic verse we always use, Proverbs 27 17. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. The wisdom lesson of this proverb is referring to mutual strengthening, two solid forms, iron, equal, equally yoked, by the way. It's not iron and then aluminum foil. <laughs> An aluminum can is going to be crushed by a piece of iron. You see what I'm saying? It's two people that know that they are believers in Jesus Christ and they're growing. They come together and because they, they're both growing separately with God, they come together and they're both sharpening and motivating and encouraging one another. And it benefits them both. We know in other place in scripture, we already know that bad company corrupts good character. 
Paul said that. But godly, amen. But godly company, I will say, builds godly character. As we stay connected to Jesus, the fruit of Jesus grows in us spiritually, and it comes out physically how we love and treat each other. The same thing goes when we're with other people who are godly. They help build godly character. Church, I can't tell you enough. You need to be careful who's in your circle. And what's important is you need to know truth so you can tell when something's off in your circle. If there's another reason to read the Bible, not just for us, but for our kids and our friends and our circles, it's, that's it. I don't get why we Christians, 5% of Christians in America are reading their Bible daily. 5%. I don't get that. That's sad. Isn't that sad? I'm not trying to judge anyone or condemn anyone. I'm just trying to correct us. Dear goodness, we got to change. We have to know our word. <laughs> Here's why. We're supposed to bring it to our fellowship with one another and help each other. Maybe that's why we're not growing and changing America because we're not together reading the Bible and we're not reading the Bible alone and then bringing it together. We're dull. We're not sharp. It's getting real in here, isn't it? I don't care. I say all that in love. Can you imagine if I didn't hang out with God all week and I decided to come up here and preach? Wouldn't that be messed up? I just want to let you know, you belong to the fellowship of the priesthood. In other words, we are all called priests in God's eyes. You need to read that. It's in the Bible. We all have a responsibility to know the word of God and lead our homes and lead our friends and lead our neighbors. We all belong to the priesthood. It's wow. And so together we grow. And let me get right into it. So how, does it, how do we actually do this? Because you're like, Ryan, you keep telling me this. This is the third week you're telling me this. So give me some practical things to do when I get with people. Great. Let me do that. But before I give you those four things, let me give you two things that are extremely important. One, in order for us to fellowship with other believers, we must first fellowship with God. Amen? And I've already said that multiple times. If we don't, what do we actually bring to that fellowship with other believers? Maybe human philosophy? Maybe something that's not biblical? Probably. We want to be with God alone so that we can bring something of worth and value to each other. We can't withdraw something that hasn't been deposited. We can't pour out what hasn't been poured in. Secondly, we must be committed to one another. What good is it to make a plan to be with some other believers other than Sunday morning at church, but to be with other believers and we never show up? And we're not committed to encouraging each other. Church, we have to make a commitment, and that usually means something else on our calendar dies so that we can bring life to that fellowship. I will cut out something in my calendar to help a brother or sister in Christ grow in Jesus. We must be like that. We must have that kind of commitment. So what four things can we do? Let me, let me share these in closing with you. I won't be able to expound on them as long as I did in the first service, but let me break four things down that you can do with three people, five people or less. And this can happen in groups, but it kind of loses his intimacy a little bit and personal touch when you do bigger groups. But here's something I want to teach, uh, teach you if you get into a group this September. We're starting our groups up again, and we, we still need more group leaders. But here's the thing. When you get into a group of 12 people, you often connect with like three to five people. So in that group, you kind of end up having this, this mentality of being there for a few. But if you're not part of a group, develop 
a little small group of like five or less people and do these things, I promise you, it's gonna bring life and it's gonna help you grow. It's gonna change your perspective on so many things about being in the body of Christ. It's so encouraging. So let me get right into it. Number one, the obvious, share biblical truth. When you come together, because you've been fellowshipping with God and reading his word, you can bring into that fellowship with those few men or women, or maybe you have couples or, or families, you bring what God has been teaching you. My mom actually had a group called Iron Sharpens Iron, and they would read the Bible together and then bring and share what they learned that week and then prayed over it. Then they started doing after the sermon discussions, they take our sermons and they begin to talk about them that Thursday night or Wednesday night, I forget when they met, and they would discuss them. I think that's smart, that's great. So you bring biblical truth. Well, what if I forget? Write it down. Grab a journal and write down what you want to bring. And here's the value of doing this. You're gonna get into a group of men or women or whatever it is, and someone's gonna bring a perspective that, they've, that you've never thought about. Do you know why? Because they went through it. Because they've been through that kind of scripture. Or maybe they were raised in a different home and they knew what it was like to be without a father. And so it brings a new perspective on God as our father. Or maybe they bring in this amazing question that you never thought to ask when you were reading Colossians chapter 2, 6 through 7. That's what happens when you get together and you share the truth. You get a whole new fresh lens and perspective on things, but you come together and interpret the scripture the way it is supposed to be interpreted. But what I'm saying is, some of us have been through some things or have lived in different areas around the world who can shed light on how this scripture is applied in our lives. It's beautiful. The second thing we can do together after we share scripture is we be transparent. We share our weaknesses, we share our victories. We celebrate together. We celebrate what God has helped us get through. We share what we still need prayer for. Now, this takes time and trust. And so that doesn't, that doesn't often happen right away. But how do we know how to pray for someone if we don't get real and honest with each other and share what's going on? You want to do that. Thirdly, accountability. Accountability. Why is accountability important? because you're agreeing to help each other grow, a mutual commitment to be there for each other, and you may agree on a few things, like, hey, we're gonna read our Bible every day, we're gonna pray, we're gonna love our family members, we're gonna serve our neighbors, our community, and when you come back together, you go, how did you do? I did terrible, I need help, pray for me. Well, what happened? I just got so busy, I, I didn't even, do half of what I'm supposed to do. All right, well, let's, let's, think, let's think of what we can do differently this week, and let's pray about it. And, and we're going to text you and, and just, you know, make sure you're reading the Bible in the morning because we love you. We want to make sure you're getting God's word. That's accountability. It is so important that we not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. That's James chapter 1. Not just knowers of the word, but obedient servants to the word of God. Being obedient to what the Bible says. Knowledge with obedience equals spiritual growth. And sometimes we need our brothers and sisters in our corner, in our circle, to go, hey, come on, man, do that. Live that out. Spurring one another on, as Hebrews 10 says towards love and good deeds. And lastly, we pray together. We pray together, church. I gotta tell you, some of the most amazing moments in my Christian walk and my life has been in prayer meetings. Praying with others and them. Have you ever heard some people's prayers? It sounds like heaven came down on earth. But listen, Sometimes that simple prayer of like two lines ends up being just as powerful. You know why? You never thought of praying that. 
See, we edify, we build each other up, we expand our prayer life when we grow together. We think of things to pray for we never thought of praying for when we pray together. We carry each other's burdens, as we talked about last week, when we pray together. And there's another thing that happens too. We fight for each other when we pray together. We wage war against the devil and the evil spiritual powers of this world when we pray for one another. Yes, amen. When you're not physically around each other for Bible study and accountability and transparency, you can continue to pray for your brother or sister in Christ. This past week, God put people on my heart to pray for. Some I was able to get a hold of, some I was not. I thank God that I did pray. I have no idea what they were dealing with, but I prayed. And I believe that God was going to work. And it is so encouraging to come together and pray for one another. So review, number one, in order to have this kind of fellowship where we help each other grow. Some people call this discipleship groups. Some people just call it small groups, life groups. The first thing we do is we fellowship with one another and then we commit to be there for one another. When we do commit, we get together and do four things. Share biblical truth. Share the Bible. The Bible should be at the center of your time together. Secondly, get transparent. I know that can be awkward. I know that can be, it can get real, real. You know what I mean? Like real, real. Confidentiality and trust. It stays in that group. Thirdly, accountability to apply what we learned in scripture, but also to improve in the areas we're supposed to improve in. And you do that with love. And then lastly, we pray together. Church, I took 15 minutes, actually eight minutes, to teach that today, because I think that's extremely important. I think it's so important that I equip you to do what I'm saying, the Word of God, really what the Word of God is saying to do. Let's take this, and it's also on our website, calvarydover.org forward slash grow. Begin to find other believers Okay, and if we, we need to do a better job here, I can't wait till we have our lobby open. It's supposed to be open coming up here real soon outside. But when you get involved in groups, when you serve here, you get to know other people and we're praying for each other. We're meeting together. We're there for one another. I highly encourage you to get in a group or get involved in serving because you will be surrounded with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who will help you. Okay. And again, I'm going to re reiterate something you really do bring something to the table. Please quit shooting yourself down as you, like you don't have any ability to help people grow. You're wrong, you do. Because as Jesus grows in you, he's gonna come out of you. And you're gonna lead by example, and you're gonna lead with your teaching and counsel. And we always stay humble about that, okay? Always stay humble about that. Can we stand together? Let's pray. Again, I just find that this is so important. If I didn't have a few men in my life to help me be where I'm at today, I wouldn't be here. I'm telling you, right, I would not be here if I didn't have men of God who were sharp, who were iron in my life to help me get where I'm at today. God used them to help me grow and to shape me into the man I am today. It was my dad, my brother, my youth pastor, and friends in this church. I wouldn't be here without them. And you ready for this? I still have them in my life. Because I want to keep growing. I want more of Jesus. I want to encourage you to find someone in your life. I know that we have to try to make that happen. So September 4th, when we come out here to worship, let's get to know each other. Let's get together. And let's grow together. And then soon we're going to learn that we go together. Amen. God, we thank you for this message. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence in this place, but also in our hearts and our lives. We walk with you, God, and you walk with us. So we will leave these doors continuing 
to worship you with our lives, with our thoughts, with our actions, continuing to give, continuing to learn from your word and worship. And Lord, bring people in our lives and may we pursue people where we can grow together. People that will help us grow closer to you and become more like Jesus. We thank you for your word today. We thank you for the practical application and the tips here today. May we use them, God. May we grow spiritually because we apply and obey the knowledge we receive today. We love you. We declare you as faithful. We declare you as God over all other gods. There is no other God but you. And God, we submit to your son, Jesus, who is over all spiritual powers in the world. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day and have a great week as well. We will see you next week.